So I guess we'll just get started a little bit early and um, I'll just give you guys a brief description of what Trading the News is. So for those of you that are familiar with my research, I tend to trade anywhere between a few days, maybe even a few weeks. But Trading the News is slightly different. And when I'm looking to trade the news, and because I have such a strong background in fundamental analysis, I look at trading the news as something that's, that's uh, right up my alley. And I actually uh, like to take advantage of a lot of the volatility that comes after a lot of these news events. And today we'll be go going over three examples. And essentially, when we're looking to trade the news, uh, sometimes it's very clear cut. But other times, it's not really clear, especially when we take a look at the initial reaction following these major event risks. Today, we'll be going over some of the steps that I really like to take and a lot of the checklists that I have uh, before I look to even trade the news and essentially my thought process of when I look at the price action following a lot of these major event risks. But be before we get any further, let's quickly go over this risk disclaimer. So like trading any financial product, trading foreign exchange entails a lot of risk and is, not certain, is certainly not suitable for everyone. So I definitely recommend everyone do, to do their own homework know what you're getting into because, a le because we do have a high degree of leverage in, in foreign exchange, which can act as a double-edged sword. So uh, we'll be going over a few examples today, but of course, uh, past performances are not indicative of future performance as well. But we'll just jump straight into things today. So trade the news. So basically, what moves the currency market? And these are sort of the two areas that I, that I like to focus on when I'm looking to trade the news is economic developments, which entails growth rate, private sector consumption, unemployment, as well as inflation. While on the other hand, we have monetary and fiscal policy, which basically revolves on interest rate decisions, central bank rhetoric, economic forecasts from policymakers, as well as public finances. So these are two areas that I really like to focus on uh, they tend to have the greatest impact on the currency market as a whole. So what is my checklist for trading the news? So essentially, when we're looking at a lot of these event risks, and I'm sure for those of you that have checked out the daily FX economic calendar, on a week-by-week -week basis, from the major industrialized countries, we have anywhere between 100 to 160 event risks. And when we take a look at that list, sometimes it might be overburdening. And at times, you might not even know which ones we should be focused on. So in essence, the first step that we should be taking is choosing the event that produces the volatility, as well as we want to track the market expectations. And in terms of that, we want to know what are the numbers that the markets are looking for. So are they looking for a higher rate of inflation? Are we looking for a lower rate of growth? And we want to track that so we know initially what to expect from the market. At the same time, we want to focus on specific currency pairs uh, that tend to show the best reaction to a lot of these economic event risks. At the same time, we want to identify medium and short-term trends, and as well as picking reasonable targets and stops. <clears throat> so choosing the event risk. So I just, our first example here is going to be on the June non-farm payables report. Of course, we see it up there. And uh, in order to assist our clients, our daily fixed calendar has its importance. But even though we have this, we have two that are rated as high. First being the actual non-farm payables report, or the non-farm payables reading, and the second one being the US unemployment rate. So between these two, we're still set with the decision of which one do we choose. And in essence, the one that we should be looking at is essentially the headline reading, which is the change in US non-farm payroll. So given that we already saw this June reading, and we did see that missed market expectations by uh, quite a big of a, of a margin, we'll see what happens. Uh, essentially, as we do see the data cross the wires. But uh, before we get any further, again, we want to track market expectations. And my, uh, what I mean by that is we want to know how the data has performed over the last few months. So taking a look at the month prior, we see non-farm payrolls disappointed also in the month of May, coming in at 54K amid expectations for 165K. But just before that, we actually see a top expectations coming in at 244K for the month of April, topping forecast for 185K uh, print. So what does this suggest? We saw the, the May report miss expectations by a pretty big margin, but we see the June one was even worse. So what does this data suggest? And what is sort of the trend that we're seeing with this non-farm payrolls reading that 
ultimately, unemployment, uh, or actually employment, uh, is getting pretty bad. And the situation that we're seeing here is sort of a downward trend in, in labor growth. So now that we know that we're expecting to see a lot of, or that we have seen a lot of dismal readings coming out of the non-farm payrolls, we want to choose the pair that fits the trade. And we also want to look at the relative price action. Basically, we want to know, is this pair in a trending or range-bound market? At the same time, we want to look at the intraday swings and highs just ahead of the release. So choosing the pair that fits the trade. So we want to pick the pair that tends to have the highest liquidity. The reason why is because when we do see a lot of these news events cross the wires, we see a big pickup in volatility. Sometimes, uh, especially when it's on Fridays, we see market participation uh, start to tail off. And in turn, we see higher spreads. So it basically raises the cost for us to trade this event. And not only that, we want to pick the pair that has the best available spread because, again, we, we're here to try to make a profitable trade. So in essence, we want to have the lowest cost possible associated with our trading strategy here. At the same time, we also want to pick a pair that's not trading at an extreme level. And for those of you that have been following me uh, for a lot of my event risks or some of my webinars, although we do see a good reaction, especially when we're taking a look at US data, we do see the Japanese yen or the dollar yen actually uh, show a good reaction. But I haven't traded the dollar yen for quite some time. The reasoning why is because we see it at such extreme levels, uh, essentially at record lows. So I look at other pairs uh, that we could potentially trade off this event. So what pair do I choose? I choose the euro dollar. So for euro dollar in 2011, for the, for the first half of the year, we see the euro dollar in this upward trending channel. And we just want to identify pretty much what has been going on with the euro dollar before we come up to this event. So we see that upward trend, which got broken around that May period. And now we see the euro dollar sort of in this consolidation pattern this downward trend line that we have up on top, but we do see some support or we do see a floor right around that 140 level. So knowing this, we do, ex we do see that essentially the euro dollar is really just moving sideways. So giving us uh, expectations that if we do get a good print, it can move in either direction and it gives us room to the upside as well as to the downside. So beyond that, now that we have sort of the medium term picture for the euro dollar, we want to look at what happened to the euro dollar just before the release. So non-farm payrolls tends to come out, or pretty much always comes out, on a Friday. Based on that, I took the price action from July 3rd to July 7th, so from, Monday, from Sunday pretty much all the way through, uh, through Thursday. And here we see with the euro dollar, it's pretty in a good, this clean downward trending channel here. So we first drew this top line here, confirming that downward trend, and then we just made a copy showing that it's relatively within a good, stable channel here. So based on the analysis that we get from the weekly price action, we pretty much know that US, the US dollar was strengthening, uh, strengthening ahead of this release. Not only that, we saw the US dollar rebound from a weekly, or we saw the euro dollar rebound from a weekly low of 142.20 just ahead of Friday. But at the same time, we're seeing the euro dollar uh, holding that downward trending channel. So in essence, what does this mean for us? So Going back to this chart here, essentially, depending on the data, we could, we're gonna, we could either see a breakout or we're going to see a continuation of this trend here. So getting on with the presentation and getting back to our checklist here, first off, we want to know whether is, is the news going to be bullish or bearish for the US dollar. Not only that, we want to ask ourselves, or we want to, what we really want to do is wait for this news as we really assess whether this news is bear, bullish or bearish for the US dollar. And we want to wait for this news to feed through, and we want to wait for a real reaction. Not only that, we want to look for confirmation behind the initial reaction. So for those of you that have joined me for some of my webinars, I typically like to wait, and sometimes I don't even take a trade depending on how the market reacts. So again, when we're looking to trade the news, we're going in the mindset of preserving our capital, and we're not really trying to jump on any moves that we're seeing. We want to be very patient. We want to wait because there's a lot of volatility immediately following, especially some of these major event risks. And we want to make sure that we'll be on the right side of the market before we even take a trade. Beyond this, we want to, we want to ask ourselves, is the event tradable at all? So again, we want to weigh the risk versus rewards. In essence, 
If we do see spreads winding so high where it's anywhere between maybe even 10 to 15 pip spreads, do we really want to take that additional risk because of the spread? That's just an added cost. So are spreads good enough that we actually want to take a trade? Is, that gonna, is, is the cost beneficial enough that it's going to help us to produce some good pips? Beyond that, we also want to identify some appropriate stops and limits uh, when we're looking to initiate a trade. So we'll go over the basic strategy that I like to use, and uh, it's pretty much across the board for us here at Daily FX, but this is the basic strategy that we like to use here. And essentially, we start off with the trade, or if we're, even, uh, if we're looking to trade this event, we initiate a trade with two lots. And again, these two lots are relatively small positions, and we do this because we're trying to anticipate a move, we want to get in that, and at the same time, we want to be able to lock in some profits, and at the same time, we want to let it run if the market, part, if the market reaction continues to gather pace throughout the day. So, we initiate a trade with two lots, and essentially we want to place the initial stop for both lots, at essentially right after or right as we enter the trade. And this strategy will become more clear as I go over my examples, but uh, essentially I just want to go over this so we have a clear understanding of why or what we're doing when we're looking at the relative price action. So after we place both of the stops on our, uh, both stops on our initial position, we want to set the target for the first lot, but at the same time, we want to have an open objective for the second one. So again, here's that mentality where we, we want to get what we can, but at the same time, we want to have a leeway so that if we do see the market reaction continue to gather pace or if it even accelerates, we want to be able to also grab that as well. Next step is we want to move the stop on the second lot when the first trade reaches its mark. So in essence, when our first lot, when we're able to gather in those gains, what we want to do is in order to protect that on our second remaining lot, we want to move the stop to cost, essentially at break even. So regardless of what happens, even if our second position doesn't work out too well, we'll still have the gains that we made with our first lot. Lastly, we want to use discretion in our second target, and we'll get more into that uh, as we head towards the end of the presentation today. But again, coming back to that non-farm payrolls exam before the month of June, we had a print of 18K, and essentially, we, all we know is that it's very disappointing, but again, this is, uh, this is a very clear example where we do see a very bad data coming out for the US dollar, but what do I use when I look at some of these event risks is I like to use a scale of divergence. And this is something I do personally, and I like to, I like to put a 50% scale of divergence to the upside as well as to the downside. And what I mean by that is I, if we get a print of, if we had a non farm payrolls print of 50% lower than forecast, so in essence, if we had a print of a 53K for non farm payrolls, I would assume that would be very, very bearish for the US dollar and essentially I would probably have this expectation of selling the US dollar. Vice versa, if we did see non-farm payrolls come in 50% better than expected, so coming in at 158K, I would do the reverse where I would be looking to buy the dollar and go long on the dollar position. So here we have the actual price action and here we have the initial market reaction. So this is 12.30 GMT and this is a five minute chart of the euro dollar. So here we have non-farm payrolls crossing the wires not much of a reaction here. Initially, we really just see the pair maintain this relative range that we saw just ahead of this release. And uh, pretty much, we're just at this point, remember, we're still on the silence. Just because we did get that dismal print and we are seeing that bounce in the euro dollar, which is the bearish dollar reaction, we, have, we haven't really taken a trade yet. And again, at this point, we're still waiting because we want to see this market reaction really play out. Scroll five minutes ahead we see the euro dollar break out of that range here. And then we see it uh, moving higher, or initially we actually saw it spike down all the way down to 142.05. So basically we saw it spike pretty far down, but we saw it move all the way back up to close higher on the day, and it, or to close higher on that five minute candle. And we actually saw it close above that range. So initially, if we take a look at this candle, it's actually pretty wide coming, uh, you know, topping out all the way above 140, uh, 142.70 but dipping all the way below that 142.10 level. So we have this big range, and again, at this point still, even though we see all this volatility, we're still sitting at the markets. Why? Because we want to wait for that confirmation. So let's just say we saw this break below the range and we actually shorted. We would have been really out of the money at this point. And this is just 
initially five minutes following, this, following the release. So what do we do next? We're still sitting on the sign lines here. We're waiting for that confirmation. So are we getting this confirmation? Initially, at this point, we are seeing some good confirmation. Why? Because going back to the previous uh, example, we had a tighter range for the euro dollar that I was watching, but now I widen it to pretty much the overnight range that I saw completely for the euro dollar. And now it's actually breaking above that overnight range closing higher and closing above that 142.80 uh, level. So again, giving us that confirmation that we want, we saw a, bear, a really bearish number for the US dollar, that 18K print, again, far missing or really missing that, uh, really missing market expectations. And now we're seeing this bearish US dollar reaction gather pace. So at this point, I'm feeling more confident that ultimately we might see this gather pace. And in essence, at this point, I might be considering to take a long trade on the US dollar and looking for some potential entries, as well as looking at some price levels where I might be looking to take profit. So right here, uh, essentially what we want to do is, the strategy I like to use is, I like to pick out a lot of these ranges, and what I like to do after these ranges is, once we do see a break of this range, that gives me a signal that maybe I would like to go long on this pair, but I want to see this gather pace. And that's why I like to put my entry a little bit above that because if we are if, or if we should see this momentum gather pace we should see it really build up and we should get a good move out of that so what have I done here is we saw a break up out of the channel and it's 1245 GMT right now so it's essentially 10 minutes following this release and I'm still out of the market and yet I'm starting to maybe think about an entry right around that 143 level <clears throat> and essentially what would I do here since I picked out my entry I'm looking for a place to protect myself and I'm looking at that range that we had overnight as a potential stop for myself. So in essence, we would have a 26 pip range between our entry and the stop. And what would I do for my limit? Just have that equal to our risk. So I would look for another 26 pips to the upside here. So this is how my trade would look like here. So by 12.45 GMT, I had my entry at 143. We saw a trigger. So at this point, I'm, I am long. And we have our stop again here at 142.74 with our limit at 143.26. But what do, we, what do we see here? Essentially, right after we, our entry got triggered, we actually hit our first limit here. So in essence, our first position would have got closed out. We would have been able to gain that 26 pips, and we would have been able to lock in our profits. But remember, at this point here, our second, our second lot is still open. We did not place a target for our second position. So we were able to pick up those 26 pips, but our second position is still open. So going on with this basic strategy that I laid out before, <clears throat> at this point, we want to move up our stop, the initial stop that was at 142.74, back up to cost at 143, initially protecting our gain. So this happened five minutes following, so 1250 GMT, and right now we're able to close our position, pick up those gains for that first position, and now we're just holding on to the second round where regardless of what happens, we were able to take the gains on the first position. So, Let's fast forward here, two hours later, 1450 GMT. What essentially happens? We see the euro dollar, it actually topped out just right around that 143.40 level. And by the end of the two hour session, our second position got stopped out. So in essence, we were able to pick up those gains. While we did take a chance of trying to pick up some more gains, we were actually able to protect that first profit that we were able to make. And we were still able to come out of this trade with 26 pips. So. We'll take a look at what happened for non-farm payrolls for the month of July. And we actually saw a better than expected print. So again, we saw that declining trend where we saw non-farm payrolls miss market expectations. But now we're seeing non-farm payrolls come out better than expected. And again, when we take a look at our scale of divergence, again, 50% lower, we would have looked for a 43 print. But we saw a better than expected print, not all the way there at, 120, at 128K, but still, it was fairly positive. So what we get from this data is we would look for a bullish US dollar reaction in essence of the positive development here. But taking a look at the price action here. So again, getting back to that 12.30 GMT time frame, we see non-farm payrolls release uh, come out. And what we actually see is we saw the US dollar rallying even ahead before the data came out. We saw it break out of this range. And we actually see a high of 142.16. So at this point, I'm really just sitting there and, and again, we're out of the market, we're not, we're not taking any positions yet, and we wanna to wait to see whether we're gonna see the reaction that we're expecting, 
again, a bullish US dollar reaction to this data. So moving on, 1235 GMT, five minutes later, we see a spike all the way down to 141.56, and we're seeing the euro dollar trade back within that range. So completely retracing that rally that we saw just ahead of this data, and it's coming back in. And at this point, again, we're still waiting for that confirmation. So what am I looking for here is, I really want to see a break below that range here, just ahead of the data, a break below that 141.49 level to really give me the conviction that ultimately we might see this momentum gather pace and I might want to trade it. Fast forward five minutes, we see another push lower. We're seeing the euro dollar uh, continue to trade within this range, but uh, really right now we're, we saw a break above right around to 141.80, coming back down and closing lower. So again, giving us that added confirmation that ultimately maybe we'll see this momentum gather pace, this bullish US dollar reaction gather pace. So what will we look to do here? And again, as I mentioned before, the conviction that I would like to see here is a break below the range here. Maybe I'll look to enter a trade at 141.45. So again, we're still at 12.40 GMT, and this is my thought process of what's going on here. So we're seeing that bullish dollar reaction that we were expected to see, it's panning out, and we're seeing price action trade back within this range. So once we do see a break, I'll look to jump in. So we have our entry, start, uh, entry at 140.145, but let's take a look at what happened in the next five minutes. We see our entry get triggered at 1245 GMT. And we have, again, my stop is standing at the top of the range here. So a little bit wider than our previous, uh, our previous example here, but basically we want our limit to equal our risk. So our target is all the way down here at 141.20. So now we have our trade set up. We're actually in the position. We have our stops and limits in place. And all we can do from here is really just watch what happens. So let's fast forward an hour. And what we clearly see here is right after our entry got triggered, we see it quickly reverse and really just taking us out of this trade almost within the first hour of trading. So we, our stop was triggered at 141.70, and we see the euro dollar actually rally all the way back above that 142 level. So clearly this example here that, that we just had with the, the July non-farm payrolls report didn't pan out as we expected. And at times, and 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 really, when we're trying to trade a lot of these event risks, this, in essence, can happen many times. And, uh, and this is the reason why we want to have really close stops and limits, where we're able to really just pick up those gains following the immediate market volatility. And here, again, we took all the steps that we could possible to really preserve our capital, to try to be on the right side of the market. But again, sometimes it doesn't play out how we want it to. And this is why we want to have that good, that we want to be able to pick out our targets and stops as we get into the trade, and we want to have those clear levels marked out uh, before we jump into a trade. So this is sort of the economic data that we will be covering, and we'll move on to my next example here, which is based on monetary policy, based on the FOMC interest rate decision. So I really like the FOMC rate decision because personally, when I was in college, I never understood why what the Fed said would move the market so much, but really, looking at the example, we'll see what happens. But uh, this is just another uh, example of why it's very interesting and why uh, I really like to trade the news because we do get that mar we do get that good bit of volatility following these major event risks. So, in essence, this is slightly different. Why? Because unlike the non-farm payrolls report where we're actually waiting for a number print or a print, essentially we were waiting for the Fed to really just hold the benchmark interest rate steady at 0.25 percent, which came across and was in line with expectations. So. What can we really look for in the FOMC interest rate decision? So no real scale of divergence here with the, with the FOMC interest rate decision. Why? Because we already expect the Fed to keep the benchmark interest rate steady. At the same time, we want to focus on the policy statement because we don't have that scale of divergence here with the FOMC interest rate decision. Beyond that, we want to really just weigh the economic assessment from the central bank. Because we don't get a shift in the actual benchmark interest rate, we want to look at what they have to say, what they have to tell us, and based on their assessment of the economy, we want to have our own projection, and we want to take that and make our own assessment of what we should expect from the Fed going forward. So with the Fed interest rate decision, this is actually the policy statement that followed after we got the rate decision. And basically, the Fed said that growth and inflation was slowing, 
At the same time, they actually said that they'll maintain the zero interest rate policy until the, mid the middle of 2013. And beyond that, they said that they'll use policy tools uh, as appropriate to stimulate the economy. So taking a look at this, they're saying that growth and inflation will slow. They're saying that they're going to keep rates low for a very extended period of time. And at the same time, they're saying that they might actually introduce additional measures to support the economy. So in essence, what does this mean? It's fairly bearish for the US dollar. So taking a look at what's happening here with the FOMC interest rate decision. And for those of you that were actually, were actually watching this, they actually delayed the interest rate decision. So at 1815 GMT, we really didn't see much of a reaction at all. Nothing happened at that point. And again, there was no reaction because we saw a delayed policy statement. But immediately following that, and once we did see the policy minute cross the wires, at 1820, G, uh, 1820 GMT, this bearish reaction that we were expected to see from the, from the FOMC, we saw that the euro dollar spiked all the way up to 143.13, uh, really just breaking out of that range here just ahead of the data, but closing right below at 142.91. So in essence, again, we're seeing that conviction that, yes, we were waiting for this bearish US dollar reaction, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the euro dollar pop higher. But taking a look at the next five-minute candle, we see momentum really tail off, and then we see even a bigger violent spike. So we see it spike all the way back down in this range, coming all the way back up here to just close a little bit above uh, this range that we have here. So we see a rebound from 142.08 to close at 142.62. So getting pretty violent here. And again, at this point, we're not looking to jump in any trades, and we're still waiting for that confirmation to jump in a trade. Or rather than that, really just waiting for that conviction whether we want to even trade this event risk or not. So fast forward to the next five minutes. All of a sudden, after seeing these two big spikes, price action really just ta ta uh, tapers off. And we see vol volatility slow, euro dollar starting to consolidate. And really, we see the euro dollar holding within a 30 pip range. And at this point, we're kind of asking ourselves, like, is this even worth trading? And this is kind of what's going through my head, is because we see this big move, and all of a sudden, things are not moving at all. So I'm waiting to see whether is can we even expect even a more volatility from this pair, or are we just going to see it really just continue to taper off? So again, at this point, we're still waiting and watching to see how market participants are reacting and whether we'll see this momentum gather pace. Let's fast forward half an hour. And what we saw here is here we had the interest rate decision that where nothing happened. We saw that big spike, and then we saw that big spike down. And again, not much going on, but at this point, we see it just steadily, steadily coming down within the lower bounds of this range. So as you trace back within this range, this is where I'm getting very interested in. Maybe we still have a chance to trade this event. And remember, this is approximately 45 minutes after we saw the interest rate decision, but yet we still see some movements here. And again, I'm still watching the pair. So what I'm, what I'm really expecting to see here is, are we going to see a break below this? Essentially, just because it breaks below doesn't mean that I'm going to trade it. Why? Because, again, we were looking for a bearish US dollar reaction, but we're seeing the US dollar actually recoup those losses following the, non -farm, uh, following the FOMC interest rate decision. So at this point, and especially when I see this here, I'm just looking at giving up. I'm looking at maybe I should go look to trade something else. But let's move on to 1905. What do we see here is following that correction, we see another big spike to the upside. So at this point, I'm getting very interested again. Maybe we're going to see this gather pace. And I'll give it another try. I'll keep a watch on it. And if we see it break above this, uh, this range that we saw overnight, once again, maybe I'll look to trade it. And my entry would just be right around above that, right around that 142.60 level. So taking a look at the next five-minute candle here, we did see a break above. So we see a break to the upside. And this will be a little bit different. Why? Because first, I actually set up my limit here. And after I set my limit, that's actually when I uh, set my stop. So the mentality that I had with this non-farm payroll, payroll uh, or actually the FOMC interest rate decision here, I was just pretty much looking for a test of that high that we saw immediately following this release. And after jumping in right around that 142.60 level, looking for a test of that high right around 142.90. So looking for that 30 pip gain right there. So I put my stop according to that 30 pips to the downside. So We'll see how this trade pans out. And again, remember, it's 1910 GMT right now. So it's nearly almost an hour after we got the release. But now I'm starting to look to trade this event here. 
And it is, in, in essence, it basically took nearly an hour for all this noise to clear, and now we're seeing a clear direction for the euro dollar. Taking a look here, what happens? We see the euro dollar actually rallied to 143, exceeding our stop, or exceeding our limit, and now we move our stop to cost for our second position again. So our second target remains open, and because we just went in 30 pips, we were able to put, pick that up. Maybe I'll look for another 30 pips to the upside from where we are right now. So even if we did pick a 30 pip limit, taking a look at the euro dollar by the end of the day, what happens here? We see the euro dollar really continue to push higher, closing all the way up at 143.77. So in essence, if we did, or if we did just took, or if we were looking for another 30 pips with our second target or our second position, we would have well picked that up. And not only that, we would have gone well beyond that as the exchange rate closed at 140, 143.77. So in essence, for me, I'll be more than happy to pick up that second 30 pip gain, totaling a 60 pips worth of gains from this non from payrolls report. But again, we don't want to look at this and get greedy. Again, we did see it close much higher. But again, when we're training these, not, uh, when we're training these major event risks, we want to get, go into these event risks with the, with the mentality that we're really looking to preserve our money and we want to just be able to pick up a good amount of gains where we'll be really satisfied and we really don't want to look at this back in retrospect and be like, man, maybe I should have taken uh, more risk and looked to play it to the upside because when we're in the moment, we really don't know that it's going to close all the way up there. And again, that's why we want to have our clear stops and we want to have clear limits. And in essence, for those of you that have joined me anytime for a lot of my webinars on training the news, that's, I set my stops and limits immediately once I figure out where I want to get in. And that's only after I get that conviction that ultimately I want to take this trade. So actually for my last four uh, webinars that I held, I actually didn't take a trade. I went in there with the expectation that I want to try to trade this, but unless the market conditions really pan out and it favors my view on what I expect to see, I'll just look to sit out. And again, we want to take the appropriate steps where we're really just, we want to get on the right side of the market. We're not looking to just uh, jump in and really just quickly react to the market reaction, but again, we want to be, uh, we want to be able to preserve our capital and we want to be able to get on the right side of the market. So, in conclusion, what, we're, what are we looking for again? We want to trade based on the outcome here. So, every time I hold these webinars, I get a lot of questions. So, because we're expecting to see a bad non farm payrolls report or because it's lower from the last month, can we already assume that it's going to be very bearish for the US dollar and should we go long the euro dollar right now? My answer is no. Because, again, there's always going to be that divergence. More times than not, these event risks don't come in line with expectations, uh, except for when it's uh, major event risks such as the FOMC interest rate decision. But when it's an event risk such as non farm payrolls, more times than not, it does not come in line with expectations. And that's why we don't want to take a position, and I really would not advocate that at any time, taking a position just based on the forecast number. In essence, what we want to do is we want to wait for that number to come through the wires and we want to make our own assessment as, is whether, is whether or not the data is positive or negative or bullish or bearish for the exchange rate. Not only that, we want to look for the initial reaction. So again, throughout all the three examples here, I waited and again, people ask me, David, how long should I wait? And I would say that really depends on the reaction itself. So sometimes we don't see an immediate reaction and we're really just waiting with that pharmacy interest rate decision. We actually waited for almost an hour before we took on a trade. But with the non-farm payrolls release, it was a little bit more clear and we had a better initial reaction where we were actually able to take a trade 10 to 15 minutes within or following the, the data itself. So it's very important to wait and watch for the initial reaction because we want to see is the initial reaction move in with our expectations and do we expect it to gather pace? And that brings us to number three, which is wait for the follow through. Because when we do see a lot of these event risks cross the wires, there's a lot of volatility as we just saw with, my, uh, with the examples here. And sometimes it's very, it, it's very tempting. And I would say when I'm sitting in front of my computer and I'm watching these event risks, my finger gets very itchy. And when I see a big, let's say 50, 50 pips spike to the upside, of course, my intuition is let's go along right now. But no. As we see, saw clearly with a lot of the examples, sometimes it doesn't work like that. Sometimes if we were, did take that trade, we would end up with a big loss and we would have been floating that loss for some time. So this is why, again, preserving our capital, we want to wait. And waiting is key here. We want to be very prudent and we want to really just 
wait for it until we get that confirmation that, you know what, this is kind of too good to pass up, so let me try it out. Beyond that, we want to initiate our trade with two lots again here. And again, the reason why we want to do it with two lots is because, of course, countering argument is we, we might take double the losses. But again, what is the upside there? We're able to pick up the first gains, and not only that, we're leaving the door open to pick up additional gains if we do see that initial reaction gather momentum. Beyond that, we want to set reasonable limits and stops. So people ask me, David, why don't we look for a 100 pip move? Or you know, typically they say, oh, non farm payrolls can move the market anywhere between 100 pips. So why aren't we looking for those profits? Because again, we want to just pick up that short-term volatility. We really don't know how long these market reactions are going to last. We don't know how much it's going to move. So in essence, we want to pick it. So what is my strategy here? Anything that's comfortable for me is maybe 20, 30, even 40 pips. Why? Because if we do see, or as, as, uh, you know, as market participants typically say that, yeah, non farm payrolls causes a big reaction, you know, we don't, not, don't necessarily need to catch all of that. And that's why we have that second lot there, because if we do see an extended move, we'll able to catch it anyway. So we'll wrap it up here. Um, someone's going to be in here soon. So again, I'll be at the booth in just a few minutes. So for any of you that have any more questions, please feel free to stop by.